Hey guys, how are you? This enchanting Sunday. Hey guys, logging in, get that Instagram going, get Facebook going. Hi, how y'all feeling today? I'm here in my office, some water with my Shui going, my money frog. Always facing it towards here. This is my favorite little gizmo of all time. Hey you, Dookie Boo, you are looking fine. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, doggy. Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? Did it hurt when I fell from heaven? Sometimes, and a lot of times, I got to remember that because boy, oh boy. Challenging times, guys. Challenging times. So, I've had an interesting week. I know last Sunday we got together and we did um, some soul sessions. Hey, Allison. Come on in. Hey, Robin. Hey, Nikki. Hey, Chuck. Thank you all for joining me. I'm so happy to see you. Hi, hi, hi. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with that. Here we go. I'm checking my connection on. Here we go. Hey, guys. So, hi, it's Taylor coming to you live on this Sunday early evening for L.A. And um, not so early evening. New York, East Coast. My heart has been definitely um, not troubled, but... Uh, I've definitely felt a lot of the need a lot of people have been going through this week and a lot of what's been going on in New York. Obviously, I'm born and raised and all my family is there. My parents are now in Florida and they're safe, thank God. And they're still alive with us. Um, some of the things that help ground me are smell, scents. Just smelling this orange gives me sense of happiness and the citrus it's like I do my own zesting and sometimes I uh listen to as I was telling earlier I listen to some stupid shit <laughs> but it is Woo, doggy did it hurt when you fell from heaven did it hurt when I fell from heaven anyway I got my water we're in my office um as you can see some of you guys can see here Randy St. Nicholas took that photo. That's from my soul dancing photo. There's some awards in here, but mostly this is a room for me to um, feel calm and nurtured and some of my beautiful pieces that I picked up while I was in India or all over the world, actually. Bali. So let's start off with a song. I'm starting to get a few of you guys in there. And the reason why I'm just suggesting a song today, although we know we're reading, I want to read a chapter from this book. This week was kind of trying with some of my family in New York. Um, mental health. The most trying part of this is absolutely our physical health, but mental health, which I feel is so Without your mental, emotional, physical health, guys, we are, if this hasn't been an a incredible wake-up call for all of us of uh, how closely interconnected we all are and how important our health and our well-being is. So meditation has become just an absolute tool. Physical walking or um, exercises and doing classes in the house. I've been on YouTube like you all have. I was at Boho, Beautiful, Beautiful Life. Daisy Fuentes had mentioned that site. I went on YouTube and every day I'm changing it up with some sort of activity. And I want to share with you a little bit of this right now because I needed this earlier today. And uh, let's just start it out and sing it together. I feel like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, but we're going to be Mrs. Rogers' Neighborhood. Smile, though your heart is aching. Smile, even though it's breaking. When there are 
of clouds in the sky you'll get by if you smile through your fear and sorrow smile and maybe tomorrow you'll see the sun come shining through for you With gladness, and hide every trace of sadness. Although a tear may be ever so near, that's the time you must keep on trying. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life. Why, if you just smile. I did this with um, some of the producers that work with Richard Perry. Um, just incredible to hear it back, some of the stuff from Rod's camp. If you smile through your fear and sorrow. Smile and maybe tomorrow you'll see that the sun comes shining, come shining through on you. Light up your face with gladness and hide every trace of sadness. Although a tear may be so near that's the time you must keep on trying what's the use of crying you'll see that life is still worthwhile if you just smile I'm going to stick with that theme today as we are on a soulful Sunday, as I like to call them. I got my pillow here, gonna give me some height. Woo! We're keeping our abs tight, we're keeping our bodies flexed. We are doing the work, guys, because what's the use of crying? I heard my brother was very sick this week in New York. <clears throat> Not necessarily um, did he get affected physically, he is um, mentally, not coping very well. Um, my brother is two years younger than me, and this has been a long battle he's had with some with mental illness. And um, I don't even know if I can call it a battle. I can call it a challenge. Um, as my life changed so quickly from 20 years old on, and honestly, 18, um, so did his, you know? Um, part of the book I wanna read today it's not the very beginning, not like where we grew up and how we did it, but <clears throat> this chapter is chapter six, out here on my own. When I was little, my parents, um, I remember seeing Irene Karras sing this song. Obviously it was in fame, but I remember seeing her when she just broke and ate misbehaving, just a small little musical in Manhattan Theater Club and my parents took me to see that. Hey Jason, hey Louisiana, you guys stay super safe, stay with each other, love each other. If you got friends that are sitting home by themselves, make sure they're taken care of. Make sure mentally, emotionally they feel good. Make sure you meet them outside for a walk, give them a call, FaceTime them, stay close to those that might need it a little bit more mentally that are being challenged right now and make sure they stay on their meds and make sure they're getting the help and the food that they need just in case. <clears throat> this is that trying time. As we know, just like the holidays when people go off into their families, into their, their places and the priest, people that don't have those places feel quite lost, I have a feeling. And I know I can understand that. So this chapter is chapter six. And this is for my brother, Rob. Perseverance, strength, a strength that comes from somewhere deep inside you, often through your own vulnerabilities. Our strength is tested through loss. 
Part of that is just resilience and holding on tight to the light that still has some spark left in me. That was my way of looking at it. I used to call it the hope flame. And when I started reading Og Mandino and he started reaching out to me and we started sharing his books and his words with me, what a, what a mentor for me in my youth, 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 the greatest salesman in the world and the greatest miracle. If you haven't had a chance to pick up those books, if you can grab that on Amazon, they're small, they're, they're easy to get to, and they are so truthful and uplifting. And it's another practice, but we are reading from my book, Tell It to My Heart, How I Lost My Shit, Conquered My Fears, and Found My Voice. Looking back on my musical journey, I know there are things I could have done differently. Boy, do I ever. But I'd like to think that my personal resilience and persistence helped open the door and keep it open for many other young female artists who came after me, who had something to say. Women who have since fought similar battles and have won. And I know who they are, and they know who they are. In the industry, women who have since fought these battles and have won, no doubt I was the cautionary tale in many, <laughs> in many a boardroom and a very meeting room in some of those offices, those powerful offices of those days of the BMGs and the Sonys. Um, on more than a few occasions, female artists pack a powerful punch in our business. Platforms like The Voice, American Idol, and X Factor, and social media and digital streaming have given the artists now the ability to connect directly, not through the big business, not through the big machine as we had to when I part started putting out music in the 80s, but directly with the audience to market and promote themselves, just like I'm doing now and connecting with you all. It wasn't just me who was having a hard time with the industry, it was epidemic. What a word to use in this book. Prince was speaking out against Warner Brothers, refusing to uncover his face on TV and appearing on stage with the word slave written on it, as we all remember that. Um, to demonstrate how the music industry mistreated artists and mistreated his, misappropriated his funds and challenged him. George Michael had an epic fight with Sony Records, same with Michael Jackson. Then there was the Millie Vanilli lip syncing ordeal and scandal. The status quo was crumbling from vinyl to cassettes, from CDs to the evolution, from MTV, VH1 to continuous streaming on YouTube. I'd ridden the wave as one of the hottest stars of the late 80s and 90s now a new form of music sharing and digital streaming, as we're doing now, took over. Music labels had no idea how to control it. And I was facing all the uncertainty and opportunity under the scrutiny of a label that didn't love me back. That's part of the learning. That was part of the learning, the self-love, the self-learning. My management wasn't very strong and consistent everyone having conflicts of interest and too many hands in the pie. And I know you guys have heard this all before, but there's a window, right? There's a window for an athlete, there's a window for an artist where they have the most impact. Um, mostly I knew that my heart felt, that what my heart felt was different from what they wanted, which was to disregard my own instincts and remind me daily they owned me. It was the wild woman in me, that wolf woman, if you will, that said no more. As I felt a noose was being held over my head and tightened around my neck, I had nowhere to go but through the rabbit hole. I did what I had to do to break from Arista Records, guided by lawyers who had their own agendas and own initiatives. In parties with conflicts of interest, Arista had two other bankruptcy filings happening at the same time with Tony Braxton and TLC. During that time, mine didn't end gracefully. Promised a record deal with another major label, I was immediately signed and dropped within six months. And um, I began a period of real soul searching, as you guys know from that album, Soul Dancing. Um, it was tough to go from selling millions of records to being told you can't, can't put out a record. It made no sense to me. And doors were shutting and it was only because there was bureaucracies involved because the fans weren't knowing this. The fans didn't understand why my voice wasn't on the radio. I began a period of soul searching. It was a scary time as I settled into the idea of being on my own, being my own captain of my own ship. It was almost a relief as I felt a sense of peace with letting it go. And this was 96. There was still no internet. There was no, none of that was going down. I had just gotten a cell phone. 
I'd always regretting letting the letting the role of Married to the Mob slip through my fingers in 87, not having a manager to even follow up with an opportunity like that, that when, when gorgeous Michelle Pfeiffer's management were calling. I probably wouldn't have been able to fit into my crazy schedule those first three years of my career anyway. But wow, if I'd have done it. Those are just small regrets. That's not anything you can challenge or change. But during my press and promotion for the last record, oh, this goes into the Warren Beatty thing. Do you guys want to hear about the Warren Beatty? <laughs> the most incredible man, Warren Beatty. During my press and promotion for the last record I did and released on Arista Record, which was Soul Dancing, that was 93, 94, and 95, I did a live appearance on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. The next day I got a call from my theatrical agent saying Warren Beatty would like to speak with me. He saw you on The Tonight Show last night. He wanted to meet with me about a film he was casting to star alongside his new wife, Annette Bening. Uh... I was told the film was a remake of a classic called Love Affair and Warren would like to call me to discuss the role. At the time, I know I was in touring Europe. I think I was in Denmark or uh, Norway, I believe, someplace like that. It was just very, you know, in the middle of Europe, if you will. I was on tour and in the hotel room in the middle of Europe, my alias was Miss Ruby Love. That was my room alias. Hi, it's Warren. Hi, Warren. Hi there. Do you always go under the alias Miss Love? Yes. Uh, I like how it sounds when they call my room and say my name to me. Miss Love, can we help you with something? He said Julie used to use the name Ruby too. You remind me of a young Julie Christie. Can you guys imagine being on the other end of the phone and hearing this? This is the legend. I mean, yes, you, you iconically... It was the sexiest voice I've ever heard. Warren said this. I held the phone up and away from my face and I remember looking at it and being shocked and I was like, I was straight up blushing and I was in by myself in my own room from 6,000 miles away. He got me really good. Thank you, Warren Beatty. I was beyond excited that my first major film appearance would be in a Warren, ba a Warren Beatty movie. Thank you, God. <laughs> Talk about shooting for the stars, guys. Hello. Lori, hey, babe. Can't wait to see... I know. My girlfriends and I, we miss meeting each other for happy hour. I'm not off and home. And when I'm off and home, I don't know if I sit around and read my own memoir, but sharing it with you guys today is just freaking joy. I continue. Working on that movie was an incredible experience. Here I felt pushed out of the music business and where I dominated it for years, right? Selling millions of records and then by 33 years old, asking, is my career over? And out of the blue, here we are, the king of film looking to work with me. That felt more than good. Working on that movie was a great experience. It took over a year to film, unusual to say the least, with a budget and a big budget, with big actors, Warren Beatty, Annette Bening, Gary Shandling. I remember when he used to come over to my house, some, some of my girlfriends. Gary was one funny mother freaker. Watching that show, I mean, yeah, Catherine Hepburn, who I didn't meet, she filmed like separately and this, this film that went on. But a girl that I met on the film, who you might all know, who did a little film called Sid and Nancy, I met Chloe Webb and we became very close during the filming of that movie. Warren was the most charming, brilliant man and I truly, what else can you say? He was always complimentary. He was always thinking, you could see that in his head. And he was just so, um, he was sharing. He always wanted to talk scenes through and talk things through. And this was my first endeavor into film. I was studying theatrically with a coach in New York and privately and things and starting in classes because, as I said, my music career was looking like it was taking a shit. And people were actually coming and getting very interested in, in watching me. So here I was. He was so complimentary. He'd say, I was just blown away by your performance on Jay's show. You're beautiful and you're so real. That kindness he had, which goes so far, but in his brilliance, went a long way. It, was, it went a long way for me, that kindness. It really helped me because I was in the middle of this major movie and I was never more nervous in my life. And I'd be sitting in the trailer, right, at five o'clock in the morning getting makeup and hair done. And I was just like, I can't believe I'm just going to go shoot a scene with Annette Benning and Chloe Webb. Have you seen fucking Sid and Nancy? Let alone, have you seen Annette Benning, her work? 
talk about now 20 years later or later i mean anyway i'd just be shitting my pants and what do you think would happen i'd hear knock 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 on my door and i'd be like who is it and he goes it's warren and i'd be like no fucking way but it was warren Beatty. this is warren asking how i would write your part Taylor, you have such a strong voice. How would you write your scene? So in other words, he was telling me to change the li like the lyrics now of a song, like right before I'm going to, okay, I had a lot more confidence in my singing voice than I did in my acting job. And he's going, I'm not just feeling confident about the, the words here. I feel like you would say this a little differently. And I was like, oh, dear God, Warren. Like anything else I put my mind to, I knew I had to work hard and research and get more hours under my belt. And that meant practice. So when that experience ended, I was like, dear God, I can't be fumbling lines at six in the morning. Not that I did and I didn't. My point was I was scared shitless. It's your nerves mostly that get you. Perseverance, dedication, determination. It's the voice. It's the chatter. Mental chatter. Like anything else, I put my mind to it. I took classes and I worked and I did blah, blah. Sometimes, you know, it's just a book. During the sporadic filming of Love Affair, which meant that I was going back and forth to L.A. and Warren would <laughs> just camp out while Warren put production on hold for this reason, that reason, this reason. I remember being in the Four Seasons with Gary and we'd just be laughing our ass off. And he'd be like, I mean, I'm Gary Shandling, but, you know, like, who has a production just stuck like doing nothing? And this before his show came on. It was just awesome. But during that time, I was auditioning and I was certainly touring, like a weekend warrior of in, I landed a role then in an independent film for SAG. Not, excuse me, for HBO. It was an HBO film. HBO was definitely moving and shaking at the time, and it was called Stag. I played a stripper. What a shocker. But I was a stripper with, a, with an attitude. What a shocker. And a gun. Anyway, this role I ended up dominating, and uh, I had the cast of a lifetime at that point. Was, it was Jerry Stiller. Uh, Mario Van Peebles, Kevin Dillon, Andrew McCarthy, Ben Gazzara, and one of my girlfriends I met through that, Jenny McShane, who ended up becoming quite a friend for me. And one of my huge wingers, you would, I would say, over the years. Soon I was living the actor's life, studying, taking meetings, going into LA for pilot season and looking at, pay, and looking at sitting around there. I got signed to Gallon Maury Management, met some other incredible people along the way. Rick, Mariella, Brian, just so many people in my life now. I did a lot more stuff. Babe, you got this. Esther, Columbia, I love you. I'm just trying to read you a little bit of stories, but sometimes I'm kind of bored with it. Only because, unless I sit there and tell the story in my head, but I can show you some cool pictures. This is me on the Michael Jackson tour with Tommy Burns. This is me. Two years before that, in Odessa, the Russian nightclub, where I sang for, in those days, I guess I made tons of money because it's called tips. I worked till four, five, six in the morning because those mobsters wanted those songs. And yes, I sang phonetically Russian. That's me on Top of the Pops UK and Formula Eins Germany. This is my award. In 1988, for Artist of the Year, Germany. This is their Grammy. And let me tell you something. This sucker is heavy, and it's a beautiful piece of sculpture, isn't it? It's one of my pride and joy pieces. It gets to stay in the office. I can show you my the trophy room, but what else? It's not here. It's, out. it's in the back house. Um, look at me when I was a little, that little rocker, 18, 17, 18, high school, graduated high school, and I was in those bands in the city. It probably was the bitter end, if I knew any better. This was me, my first rock star. No, it wasn't Guns N' Roses, but he was pretty big like that. His name was Bella from Diazza, a German band. Right about that time, that's when I met Prince. This is just a moment with Mr. Robert Plant, and it was more than a moment, I can promise you. Sexy motherfucker. Oh, goodness. Shall we sing a little? Did you ever meet Whitney? I certainly did meet Whitney Houston. Um, beautiful, incredibly gracious, and never, she was like an elephant. She never forgot anything. She goes, Taylor, do you remember when we did this, 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 and this, or that happened or something? She just was, 
she used to call me the voice to Dion, to, to Dion Warwick. And I was like, there was a beautiful, there was a beautiful, what Clive Davis did was he had a family, you know? So what I didn't understand at such a young age was just being in this midst, right? Of like, there was Ashford and Simpson, his, his Grammy parties were notorious. But what he had was he had a pre-party, always did, at his apartment. That was in New York and or it was in the Beverly Hills Hotel, right? In his in his um, in his villa, and there's a there's a photo in here I know of me and Aretha Franklin, Whitney behind me, Bobby Brown, Whitney. I mean, I'll find it. It's just I can just promise you. And what he always did was he always just had, you know, um, like Tony would be in there, Tony Braxton or, or or Ashford and Simpson always just, and the music would be playing and the smiles and he just would make everybody know each other, introduce everybody, everybody. And it's continued to today to all his parties, you know? I mean, really, he's always made everybody feel like the biggest bulb in the room. Here's a picture of Aretha, myself. I'm sitting on Clive's lap. Aretha Franklin is next to me. And that's Whitney Houston behind us, straight up bodyguard with the with her shawl on her head, and that's Bobby Brown with her. And that's me laughing hard, and you know, Clive was like a father to me, you know. And that's me with one of the most generous, beautiful men, who's the late great Frank DeLeo, Tukey. Some of you know him. Managed Michael Jackson for years. Um, this was in 1992, after I did the Bad Tour. And he said to me, well, he was with Michael, but he said, I want to manage you too. <laughs> we had a lot of fun together, but as you can see, and you guys remember him from Goodfellows and some films he got into. He was a piece of work. And he turned me on to LA. And when I started doing film and television here, it was really um, quite a wonderful experience to go to his house. He had a beautiful pad property in Ojai. And I fell in love with Ojai and certainly more Northern California. And just, listen, it wasn't long before I moved to L.A. Um, this is a very in incredible photo that I'm so grateful I captured this. This is in the very first year in 87 or I think 87 or 88. And there is the Berlin Wall. And there's a photo of me here. This is pre the wall going down while I was in Berlin. I was in Germany an, an incredible amount of time. Where that Artist of the Year was won that year for me, Tina Turner won it the year before. So it was quite a, an honor. And Germany, Berlin, Munich was incredible cities for me. And I don't take that lightly. Here's me in that film role that I told you. There's Kevin Dillon actually shutting up because I probably gagged him. I know, I wonder who gagged him. I think we're both gagged. That was probably when Ben Gazzara went nuts in the, in, the, in the movie, so he probably gagged us all and was going to kill us all. I'm sure of it. Tower Records, 1998, I guess, with my first release as an independent artist, Naked Without You. You guys can find that. There's a couple of real gems on that. Shall we do another song, guys? I kind of was feeling the standard mood. Standards, yes indeed. Let's go to my music. Let's see what happened here. Browse my library. Um oh this is a beauty. I was gonna save it for another Sunday, but Lauren Wild produced romantic music in the night. A dream that can be heard Isn't it romantic Moving shadows Remember, the you should parry yelling at me You should do more of these Oh Yes, that is my voice. Yes. I recorded these gems with Laura Wilde, a cast of incredible musicians. Yes. Yeah. 
knows that I think he'd be spending my evening with an icon. <laughs> Who gets her kicks? Such a love like this I hear the music playing In the trees above While all the birds are saying You were made for love Isn't it romantic? To be young on such a night as this Isn't it romantic? Every note that sun is such a lover's kiss I need circles in the moonlight Do you mean that I So what do we got left? What do we got next? Let's see what else I can show you a picture of, tell you a little story. Um, and when I moved to Los Angeles, 98, 99, or when I was, I was first here doing pilot season, and then um, I finally released that record, which was Naked Without You. I got signed by Gallon Mori, new you know management, and I really just got a resurgence into making music. Um, not easy doing it on your own, not easy putting, producing an, an entire album on your own and, and putting all the players together and the writing and the session, but it was really, I knew I could do it. Um, I started falling in love with the desert and that goes back to Chloe Webb. Chloe Webb, after shooting that film and during the shooting of that film that took a lifetime, which I told you, an affair, love affair, um, she took me to this place, uh, 29 Palms in Joshua Tree, or a little further actually. So there's Joshua Tree, which I'm sure you've all heard about, but until you've experienced Joshua Tree, the climbing, the rock, the actual stone, and the nights, and you just feel like you're on another planet. I didn't understand. I understood woods, and I understood water coming from the East Coast, coming from New York and the ocean. But the desert, I didn't understand it. And she took me there. Of course, when she pulled up in whatever little race car she had she was like is that the bag you're gonna bring and I was like yeah what's the matter with it she goes well if you pack it you carry it and I was like okay bitch so it was like huge I was used to just having people just lug my luggage around you know <laughs> this is straight up diva shit anyway long story short she got me out there and I was mesmerized the stars were just hanging the dryness the the, the terrain right the the botanicals, they were so unusual and so different. Anyway, I fell in love with Joshua Tree. I fell in love with 29 Palms and the 29 Palms Inn, which I frequented with Kelly Catrone, which I went to. And that's that horrible story she tells you where I would leave her and Julie Brown to die in the desert, which I did not. I just took an allergy pill and passed out in the car because I figured they couldn't walk more than five minutes, those damn divas anyway. Sending love from Vegas. I love you guys. I know everything's closed. All my friends that are chefs, all my friends that own hotels, all my friends that are in food and, and the beverage business. I My hearts are with all of you. Is the entertainment business. But we are finding in a way to shift. And we are connecting. Mentally, today, I wanted to connect with you. So you guys felt from my heart to yours that... Uh, we always cannot physically be there for somebody, and I've learned that. Um, and we always don't want to. We always, not always can we. Can Are we capable of it? So filling your vessel first, putting your oxygen on first, doing your meditation, doing your workout first gives you the ability to have more to give because you're receiving it during that time. It's a self-loving receiving, and you're filling up that vessel inside. And... Um, so many times when I'm on the road, it depletes and depletes and depletes, right? Or traveling or even being here because I'm a mom of these two knuckleheads, right? 
and it's a lot of one way. It goes out a lot of one ways. And yet, knowing they're here fills me with such gratitude. So I just wanted you to know that as part of my story. Reach out to somebody that might need to hear something. Call them. Try to let them physically know that they're not alone. Those you know that are, whether they're single, whether they're widowed, whether they're struggling because they have to leave school, whether they came home from college. There's some, there's some stuff going around. And uh, Puerto Rico, I love you. I just wanted to share my day with you a little bit, this soulful Sunday. And uh, let's see if we can do one more song. This is one of my, I hate doing all my standards, but why not? This is a beauty. Listen to this beautiful one. Let me go back. Listen to the string and the arrangers on this. This is Richard Perry and Lauren Wilde. This is one of my favorites. Your lips were like the red and ruby chalice, warmer than the summer night. The clouds were like an arabesque of palace, rising to a snowy high. Each star its own aurora borealis. Time. Thank you all for sharing some moments with me today. Give a friend a call. Give somebody that you're thinking of a call. FaceTime them. I love you guys. Stay safe. Holding my heart with you. Oh.